Awesome. Well, John from She Had in the green room with me today. Your background looks particularly green, so you've really teamed with the theme, but hello and thank you for joining me. Pleasure. Pleasure. <laughs> Uh, I know 2021 kind of feels like the weird um, cousin of 2020. We kind of have had a bit of false starts happening. And I know there's a lot of strangeness happening, particularly here in Australia, but um, something very, very exciting that we have got in the new horizon for 2021 is the release of the 10th studio album for She Had, Mm -hmm. Old Gods Raring to Release into the World. I know this is not a new process for you or a new situation, but does it feel like a well-oiled machine at this point, given what's happening around you? Like, can you kind of just shut your eyes and let this happen with muscle memory at this point? Um, this is the first time we've taken seven years to write a record. Like, literally what happened after Five Eyes was um, my wife and I had two children. And for the first time in my life since I was 18 years old, I had no desire to write any music at all. And uh, it just became all about the kids. But... Um, in the background she had were still meeting up every sort of once every six months jamming up some music and just like and I was just like storing it all up in the background and about year three into that process I started getting I mean because I've got two children right and um uh my wife's Sudanese right so um which was totally random uh my best mate happened to be a Sudanese national and so we decided to have kids got married and then we had two kids, you know, biracial, really interesting, amazing, beautiful children. And but in the meantime, in the background, um, you've got um, images of of people um, walking around with tiki torches in America, saying the Jews will not replace us, which is very reminiscent of of you know, because I'm a big history buff, because um, <laughs> I think it really serves to know where you are, <laughs> to to you know. So um, I just started to think, right. I've got two biracial children and that's that's becoming mainstream again it's like I and then basically all this music made sense to me after not making well I like the sound of it but I, I just didn't have any words and then and then Australia caught fire for how many months there about I don't know four three or four months and again that existential threat was there and I'm thinking man what is the world I brought these kids into and um uh and then lockdown happened in Melbourne. And it was just like, uh, I just, luckily for me, um, I, I got a friend in a band called Body Jar Ham, who owns a um, skateboard store within the five kilometer radius of my house. So uh, he let me use the basement of that place. And I just took all the Shehard music and got out four years, well, almost, yeah, four years of just going, what is happening in the world? And, is this just me feeling like this world's gone completely mad? Um, and I um, and I just had the space and just went boom, and all these words came and all these songs came, and it happened very naturally. I, I I needed it for myself, just to try and make sense of the world that we were sort of in, um, and also just to yeah, I just needed to hear some music that was basically saying you're not mad this is wrong and um uh and so that's what luckily i i play in this band that makes this really big sound at, which is the muscle memory thing i suppose coming back to your initial question it's like we've played together since we were kids at school and now i've just turned 50 and it's the same guys and we do know where each other plays and it's we do know after all these years we've worked out what was our strengths are and our strength is basically making really heavy riff based music that sort of heavy music for people that aren't really into the sort of I know um more sort of fantasy style metal I I I, for me if I'm listening to guitar rock I listen to probably the idols or just idols or sleepered mods you know it's sort of which isn't really metal or anything but it's hard music that's sort of quite honest and brutal so um and I sort of I like that sort of sticking it to the man sort of thing in my rock and roll, you know. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that's <laughs> yeah. what rock and for me that's what rock and roll is all about. But obviously, everyone has a different interpretation. But I'm totally, with you. <laughs> totally, totally, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I find that interesting. I mean, obviously you've released a couple of songs in the lead up, like Little Demons effectively and emotionally stripped the paint off the walls in my house. But it's just got so much to it. Like, yes, you've got that 
amazing she had sound like it's all really there but there's so much like thematically that is so resonant and it's like what you were saying I mean what an incredible album even as a snapshot for your children later on when you they grow up and you tell them what was going on around them but I have read you say that that chorus on Little Demons is your favorite chorus on the album which I would like to come back to but sure. just in terms of that song being one of the first songs I believe that you wrote for the album how did that song come to life? Because I believe there was quite an integral moment that kind of spurred that song. And how do you feel it sits thematically compared to the rest of the album? I think um, one, of, one of the um, things that has been really concerning me about the sort of modern sort of 24-hour news cycle is the rise of the opinion, the opinion pieces, especially, especially I'm afraid to say on the right wing. I think it's a lot, of, it's very fear-based and very, um, it's, it's to provoke reactions. It's to make people, it, it, to, to divide people, in my opinion. Uh, it doesn't bring people together. It makes people angry, make people fearful of other people, which is the thing is this band, we love, we actually like humans and we, we, we do believe in the potential of good in humans. And that's, I think, why it annoys me so much to watch, you know, people like Alan Jones, like really getting stuck into, you know, people just trying to do, make the world a better place. So, um, I mean, it's, and it's particularly relevant living in Mel Melbourne, Australia, and the guy behind it, Rupert Murdoch, is an Australian as well. So it's really interesting. Um, I mean, it's just business at the end of the day. And that, that, but I think it's really, um, I think it's really irresponsible to to do to do what they're doing. So anyway, I I was watching. Q and A one night, um, which I actually really like. I think it's a good format. New Zealand doesn't have any program like that where you actually have people from all the political spectrum talking about particular issues. One episode I saw was um, uh, Tina McQueen, who was at that stage the vice president of the federal party, uh, the Liberal Party in Australia, um, uh, basically telling a uh, First Nations um, woman who was basically saying that. In her hometown, she suffers racial abuse constantly, and you know people just screaming stuff out the windows of their cars. And um, Tina McQueen turned around without realizing what she was saying. She said, "Oh, I just don't know why you just don't call the police and have them hauled away." Not realizing that that works for Tina McQueen, the vice president of the Liberal Party, but not necessary for this First Nations woman. And um, I just think that's when I just went. I've got to use her words against her. Like I've just got to take that that bubble and just pop it, you know. Because I mean, that's just the thing. It's like going back to you know the, the opinion pieces. Everything's just it's, this culture wall is just se separating everybody to the point where we're living in different realities. And that's when you've got existential threats like climate change hanging over your head. We aren't going to be able to solve that uh, if we're all in different camps, you know. So I just I just wanted to use her words against her really, and then from there it basically blossomed into the the song. So it's sort of which goes in totally different directions. It talks about you know the disenfranchisement of of of, of sort of less powerful people from being able to vote in you know democratic elections and just things that you watch and go oh that's how that's how that works you know like watch it happen slowly erode these rights and blah blah blah. So yeah. That's yeah, Little Demons is cool like that, you know, like. So with the song, obviously, it is so hard hitting, like there's so much going on with it. And that story obviously explains how much weight is really behind it. But mm -hmm. coming back to what I've heard you say about it being your favorite chorus on the album, what is it you love the most about it? What makes this such a standout for you? I just I like the fact that I've used I've turned those words of someone who I think does is unaware of why that is offensive to somebody on its head and and attacked back and it's like i don't know i don't like using the word attack because i mean this music is definitely not pulling any punches but it's all done the thing is this heavy record's done out of like i say it's like out of the fact that we actually really love humans and it's like to watch you know people who are selfish and greedy uh basically going this is the way to be you know assume the worst in humanity, get in there first, because they're just going to screw you over if you don't screw them over. I don't want to live in that world. So this is my response to that, you know, and um, and um, I think Little Demons, the chorus is such an unusual melody line 
and and the riff is just this monolithic sort of I don't know modern out sort of our ode to a, a modern Black Sabbath. That's what we'd imagine Black Sabbath if they were doing it now, you know, like so that's what we're doing. And then to sing that over the top, it's like, oh, that works and it shouldn't work, you know. I think that's why I like it, you know, yeah. surprises me. Yeah. Well, I think the fact that you can still be surprised after all this time really excites me. Like it's just <laughs> it's so inspiring to hear that. And looking back at the immense catalogue now, I mean, going back to churn to now, like you even had mentioned when Five Eyes came out, like it, you claimed it was the best in 15 years for She Had. I know we're in very early days. We're in very fresh days with Old Gods, but how do you feel this one sits in comparison to everything that's come before it? I, I think this really is a distillation of, of, of everything that we've done. I mean, it's even got songs like Feel, a song called Feel the Fire on it, which is like we've always dabbled in like, you know, pop because we like pop music i mean my first record is hard days night by the beatles you know so um and then following that bob marley's uh, legend best of you know so i and then uh, and then from there i was corrupted by kiss alive one and then and then went into heavy guitar world so um but we've always dabbled with pop i suppose and but we've always basically gone heavy record pop record alternative record heavy record this one's like nah man just get all the bits where we do it right and go bang Luckily for us, I think we had that seven year writing period. Usually it's a two year cycle. So you usually just go, yeah, I reckon this is good, bang. Five Eyes is a little different. We had a little bit more time, but with this one, it was like seven years. And I, like I said, I didn't actually realize, I didn't even think about writing for three years, but we were making all this music. So I had so much more to, to churn through. It was almost like doing a first album in a weird, weird way. Like, because there's a reason why everyone's first album is so wicked because you had a lifetime to write it, you know? And um, in this one, I sort of feel like that with this. It's like with all the experience of 30 years of playing together, plus the space of a first album. So I think we managed to really weed it out to just being pure and bang. And it just goes, it just explodes this record. And luckily for us, um, the one, positive, one of the positive things that, about the pandemic is we wanted initially to maybe go to Chicago with Steve Albini because we always liked, you know, in utero or something like that. I wanted to hear Tom's drums recorded by him. And then pandemic meant we couldn't go anywhere. So it's like, who produces records, heavy records in Australia? And luckily someone suggested Adam Spark from Birds of Tokyo. Now, I've got to admit, I don't, I didn't know Birds of Tokyo's music that well. I knew that Kenny from Carnival sung in that band. And I had met Adam at a, a music awards and he was a lovely guy. But um, he heard our demos and went, I remember seeing you guys at a big day out really young, when I was really young, and I've never heard a She Hard record that made me, gave me that same feeling of seeing you guys live. So I really want a chance to do this with this record. And that just worked out so well, because he's, from a sonic perspective, he's just smashed it out of the park, I think, you know. Yeah, I guess what's interesting with COVID, like you saying that, is as much as we all have these grand plans and obviously as you evolve and with with how long you've been in the industry, you would have so many things still on the bucket list of that. But we've all kind of had to look a little bit closer to home. And I do love that something that you may not have ever had happen has kind of evolved from it. So there's always silver linings to be had, I guess. Absolutely. And yeah, it's I, I love it. And I also love like, you never know, like you might be a Birds of Tokyo. She had kind of a little tour on the cards. Just, if just, we can if we can tour. I mean, that's I know, right. Just, uh, <laughs> but you know. I guess like, I can honestly say this sounds like I'm kissing your ass because I'm talking to you. But like the album just from the start, like as soon as Tear Down Those Names kicked off, it just gripped me from the start. But I know like it's like potentially asking you to choose a favorite child and ironically you do have children to choose from now but mm. is there a particular song on the album you're most excited to play live that you haven't had a chance to yet when you can do this um I do think tear down those names is, is just one of those songs where it's just like wow that is a really unique bit of heavy music like modern music and um and it's just got so many crazy time signatures. Well, not, not time signatures, but more a play on time, which I really like. I love what it's saying. Um, but from a physical perspective, it's it moves really nicely. Like, I'm not sure if you've seen the video, but uh, that is pretty much the movement I see in my head. You know, it's just like, it's a dance track, but probably one of the heavier dance tracks you'll hear. So that's probably the one for me. Yeah. 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 Well, that was on my list too. So that makes me happy. I, the Hill song got me from the name, but sonically, I'm going to go with Tear Down Those Names. Awesome, man. I'm with you. I'm, with you. I'm totally with you. I love it.
Yeah. And I know aside from the new album, you've been pretty busy. Like you guys kept yourself busy, obviously making the album, but you also got signed with Unify and you released the Split Ends cover. Yeah. What was it like to tackle I Got You and give it your kind of own spin on that song? Well, luckily for us, I've been playing that in my solo acoustic shows for about six years. And so I know that song inside out. And I also know that if you get 200 people really drunk in a bar that know that song, when the chorus kicks in, it sort of sounds like Nirvana. So um, so I just was like, okay, I know exactly what we're going to do with this. We're going to strip away all the sort of cheesy 80s keyboards. We're going to basically make it as small and tight in the verses as possible and as huge and glorious in the chorus as possible and just keep it really straight. And, um, and that was our chance to work with Adam Spark for the first time. It was actually more of a trial to see if he'd work on the... On the um, producing our album and it did work obviously because it sounds really good and it's ended up being on in the top 10 of the radio charts in New Zealand for like almost a year which is totally weird to us because we just it was just to see if Adam and us clicked really but it, it I did like it and and I did have Neil Finn I bumped into Neil Finn who wrote the song you know from Split Ends Crowded House I bumped into him at a show in Auckland and he was like when I heard she had we're going to do I Got You I was thinking I've got my expectations high but you you made it better than that so I was like yes yeah, Neil Finn, if Neil Finn thinks it's awesome then it's good with me you know only problem is he gets all the publishing I don't see any of it <laughs> you get the high <laughs> praise but he gets the publishing true true <laughs> it's like yeah slight second second best. Yeah. yeah it's pretty cool <laughs> interesting like like you say that I mean you guys you are considered to be one of the most successful international exports from New Zealand. I mean, you've been labelled the greatest Kiwi rock band of all time. And I swear, like, us Aussies like to claim you. Like, we like we do with everything. We claim everyone who's not here, who's been here long enough, and we'll just want you to stay forever. But, Aww. like, the journey from high school to right now has obviously not been without its own unique challenges and hurdles. Yeah. But going back to those early days, like what was it like in Wellington? Like when you were first getting started, like how hard did you have to hustle and fight to get your music heard and get to this point in your career? Well, I mean, we were just, we were like so determined, even as a bunch of metal dweebs at um, Wellington High School. It was like, we literally didn't care about any other subject. We got the keys to the music room off the music teacher in the weekend, did that. We had no social life anyway, because we were total outsiders and dweebs and it was it was perfect for us because it was like revenge of the nerds here we go you know like we're going to be tight we're going to be the tightest band that we can possibly be and um and so really early on it was like we had a really good work ethic I think and um just because we didn't have any options to do anything else really more more than anything else but we discovered wow this is great it feels awesome so let's just do it over and over again and then when we did get out playing I discovered that yes that because I was a bit of a class clown when I was at, at school, that that translates to being a singer in a rock and roll band really well, because I like being on stage. But the thing is, when we started, because we were going really fast thrash metal, the only bands we got could get booked with were not hard rock bands, but they were like punk bands and hardcore bands. So we used to play, you know, in front of like skinheads, all sorts of people, and it was like full on. It was a really good baptism of fire to... Um, to to be comfortable in that situation. And Wellington was hard, you know, like it was pretty hardcore. It's sort of like Melbourne. It's like, they don't, they don't, they don't applause easily. You know, they, they it's like, you have to impress them. So that was a good sort of starting point for us. Cause then when we made the move to Australia, finally was to Melbourne because we knew it was the same vibe. It's like, if they, if they love you, they really love you, but you have to give them everything you've got, you know? And, um, I mean, I think we were also really lucky in the fact that we got asked to support ACDC when we were really young kids. Carl, our bass player, was still at high school. And we got to watch a band like that up close and go, oh, right, you have to work so much harder than work we're working at the moment. And then we moved to, we came to Australia. The first band we toured with was Midnight Oil. Now, that another formidable live act, you know, where you've got a singer who is literally channeling from a higher power and like giving it everything. So I think we were really fortunate in seeing a lot of quite inspired live acts, live rock and roll acts, to just make sure that we had to lift our game all the time, you know? Yeah. Well, and that's the opportunity not everyone always gets. And I mean, obviously you guys had the work ethic in you, so that's quite a fortunate thing as well. But yeah, I mean, 
just casually with ACDC and Midnight Oil, no big deal, becoming, you know, the greatest rock band from New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, here we are, like, decades later, and I will not keep you long because I know you're a very, very busy man and you're about to hop on a plane, but given you have joined me on the green room today and here is hoping that we can get so many more tours in our lives from you guys down the track, what would be one essential item you would have backstage in your green room that would keep you sane or keep you occupied when you can eventually get this touring train back in action? I'm so boring. Like I'm just, I'm like, I just, I just need water because we just like smash it out. And it's just like, I just got to hydrate, man. Yeah. That's basically it. Water. Give me water. Yeah. Water's the stuff there for me. Yeah. yeah. I don't, it's definitely not boring. And I think, you know, when you say how much, energy you guys exert on stage I think we'd actually have to insist even if that wasn't the answer because otherwise I'd be very worried about you guys so totally. <laughs> so it makes me happy I'll be like a little side band mum makes me very happy yeah. but most importantly like old gods is just incredible I will be cranking it so many times and it is an album I think we all need right now at this point in 2021 and just humanity in general but a huge congratulations for, you know, an album that we have all waited not so patiently for, but we're finally here and it's so exciting. So thank you for joining me and thank you for the new tunes. Thanks for having me, Tiana. The Green Room with Tiana Speter is a podcast from the Handshake Agency Network, produced by Tiana Speter and Andrew Mast, with Pharrell D'Souza and Henry Gibson providing research, recorded and engineered by Zig Parker, executive producer Craig Truick.